Welcome to part two of Historic Newspapers on Microfilm. In this segment, we'll outline some tips for collating newspapers on microfilm specifically for digitization. Collating your microfilm is key to your project. Why? Because the intellectual quality of your digital surrogates in part depends on the work you do here. Garbage in, garbage out, as they say. Some are willing to let their vendors do the guesswork. Others do spot checks of the data when it returns without much legwork up front, meaning they don't really know what's on the film, they only know what they get back from the vendor. They're hoping the box label and inventory, or the guide to contents if it had one, is right, but they rarely are. That's why collating the microfilm before digitization can save you a lot of headaches later. Keep in mind that many mistakes on the microfilm can be corrected in digital reformatting, but you can't fix them if you don't know what they are. Now, I'll preface the following collation tips with one important thing, and that's the real sequence number. The real sequence number is an NDNP requirement that's generated during the digitization process after scanning. It acts as a provenance marker for each artifact from the film, such as pages, targets, and blank exposures. In order to generate an accurate real sequence number, everything on your reel must be scanned and processed, including those blanks. Even if you plan to remove duplicate pages or issues before the NDNP batch delivery, or you have no intention of displaying them in your own interface, they must be captured and fully processed to generate an accurate real sequence number. So, let's collate. We'll start with a blank collation sheet. Your sheet may look a little different. In fact, your collation form may be electronic, and that's perfectly okay. Paper collation forms allow for a lot of note-taking in the margins, which, clearly, I like to do. On my collation sheet, I'm going to note some key points I'll need for my metadata and organization, such as paper position, number of pages per issue, title or titles on a reel, missing pages or issues, and perhaps other information I want to keep for later, like interesting masshead slogans, for instance. We're going to look for continuity within the reel as well as within the title, so we'll start by noting dates. I'll check for correct, incorrect, or unclear publication dates of every issue. Some folks even note each page date where applicable. It's not uncommon to find the first issue of the new year with the old year printed on the masthead. You'll want to first make sure that it is in fact a misprint. Then you'll want to note that it's a misprint. Most vendors make no assumptions about the pages. They enter exactly what's on the page. If that information is wrong, you have to tell them it's wrong, and then you have to give them the correct information. So let's say I find a weekly newspaper with two issues printed on the same date, yet they have different content. I first have to determine if that content is in fact different on a single page or throughout the issue. If the former, I'll need to decide what to deliver. Uh, remember the real sequence number, they all have to be processed, but they don't all have to be delivered. If it's the latter, then it's a simple matter of assigning an edition number. Some papers will make it easy, uh, and they'll say morning, evening, or special edition. Other issues just give you what looks like the same edition when in fact they're not. If they're different editions, um, I'll have to read some of the paper for clues as to which edition was printed first. I find it helpful to collate on a sheet with a calendar. This makes it easy for me to spot a missing issue by pattern, if not by date. Occasionally, issues are printed on off days. I'll review these, be sure that they were really published on that date. And a great tool for this is the time and date website. I input a year, and it displays the calendar for that year. If I need to confirm, say, a Tuesday publication was really printed on a Thursday, I'll compare the printed date against the same date of that year. If the date on the paper doesn't match the date of the calendar, it's fairly safe to assume that the date is a misprint. If the printed date is right, but the day is wrong, I'll confirm that the day is misprint. Sometimes they're both wrong, and then you just have to read the paper for the real date. It's like CSI for newspapers. While collating, you'll also notice chronological order. It's not at all uncommon for issues to be filmed out of order. Fortunately, the NDMP directory structure will chronologically order issues, even if they weren't filmed that way. The NDNP spec also gives you control over page order by using the metadata field page sequence order. Now, let's look at completeness. This is where you really have to pay attention. You'll want to note missing issues, missing pages, duplicate pages and issues, mispaginated pages, and pages that are out of order. As I mentioned before, missing issues are pretty easy to spot with a calendar collation sheet. Missing pages are harder to recognize, especially for papers that aren't paginated. 
By counting the pages of the first issues, a pattern will develop. Then a fair assumption of a page count can be made. This will make it easier to notice missing pages. You'll rarely get lucky enough for the masthead to give you the page count, so learning this pattern is going to be key. Still, this can be tricky, as urban newspapers tend to fluctuate the printed page count a bit more often than others. And of course, there's always the holiday and special occasion editions. But generally speaking, you get a sense of publisher intention within a few issues. Page counts aren't quite so hard if the page number is printed, but that's a rarity with historic papers. Therefore, one must creatively recognize the pages. For example, you might notice that a page is missing, but be careful about which page is really missing. And here's where another pattern comes into play. Quite often, patterns can be seen by the placement of particular ads and columns. For instance, the local social column might always be on the left side of the third page. Or an ad for liver pills may always be printed on page four. These patterns can help identify what page is really missing. Odd as it may seem, it's easier to identify what's missing from the microfilm than from the digital pages because of microfilm's linear nature. You can scroll back and forth quickly, detect patterns with ease, and you have context because of the neighboring page, especially if it's bound volume. But once those pages are digitized, they become individual page files, separated from familial context, and that can make it harder to identify what's missing. Mispagination happens frequently, more for some papers than others. It's all about patterns. So let's say page two is always printed as page eight so that every issue appears to have two page eights. Your vendor is going to assign page eight to both pages unless you tell them otherwise. So it's best to correctly identify the mispagination and pass it along. Otherwise, you'll always have two page eights and they'll probably be ordered next to each other in the interface. If you're all right with that, okay. Just know that it can get confusing for users who may be intimately familiar with the paper, as a lot of genealogists are. It could also get confusing if you have an article on page one that says it's uh, continued on page two, for instance, and suddenly page two is in the seventh position in the interface. It's also technically not the intended order of the pages. During collation, we'll want to identify duplicate pages, too. Duplicate issues are pretty easy to spot, provided you read them closely enough to be sure that they're really duplicate. Dupe pages can be harder, especially if a page is missing from an issue. It's easy to overlook the missing page with a dupe page in its place. Likewise, one might overlook additional pages in an issue thinking them dupes. But there are very obvious instances of dupes, too, and there are different ways to deal with them during digitization. You can choose to keep them or keep none of them at all. But there's a third option to consider, too, especially for pages that are dupes, yet are different. Let me explain. Let's say we have two page threes. Our first copy of page three has something cut out. Yet on the second page three, the mutilation is in a different place. Now we've got duplicate pages that have different information. Where one is missing an article, the other supplies it. Just as the second page is missing text, the first page provides that. Only together do they provide the page as it was intended. In this case, one might want to provide both pages. Now, after all this, if you still can't establish a consistent page count, or you can't find a column or add patterns, or you can't find rips, shading, or creases that mirror one another between two different pages, then the only alternative is to read the paper. And that might actually turn out to be the best part of your day. When it comes to completeness in your digital surrogates, the bottom line is this. All it takes is one typo in the metadata to rearrange your digital data. And by the time you figure it out, you've wasted a lot of time and effort to fix it. Take advantage of the microfilm to confidently establish page order, page count, and duplicate pages. It's in your best interest to collate your film before you digitize it, so that you know what to expect to get back from your vendor. Part of their job is to follow your directions. So the more clear you make the information, the more likely you'll get stellar data in return. Like I said, garbage in, garbage out. And always remember, don't panic.